And that's verses 18 through 32. Romans 1, 18 through 32. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them but give approval to those who practice them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. Uh, Lord, we do want to stop for a second and pray for Ed and his family, Lord, at this time. Lord, that you would give them uh, comfort and peace. We thank you for the hope that is ours as believers. Uh, the hope of, of heaven and of being with you and, uh, and that hope that surely had, Lord, uh, in dying uh, in Christ. Lord, we pray that as we look at this portion of your word, uh, it says a lot of things that are uh, not popular in the world today, perhaps never were. But Lord, we pray that you would just uh, open up our hearts and our minds to your truth. I ask in Christ's name, amen. This morning, we're just going to cover verses 21 through 23. And in verse 21, the Apostle Paul writes, actually, I believe this is verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Now, that word fools doesn't mean that they lacked really intelligence, that they had low IQ levels. It means that they made an unwise decision, an extremely unwise decision. And what was that decision? The verse goes on to say, or verse 23 says, and exchanged or traded the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So they made this exchange, this trade, a foolish trade, the most foolish trade. What he's saying is that mankind traded God for idols. Really, idolatry is the worship of a God substitute. Idolaters exchange or trade the worship of God for the worship of a substitute. Now, earlier, Jacob read the Ten Commandments. And what were the first two? What are the first two commandments? They're about what? Idolatry. Okay? I heard someone starting to quote it. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. And the second, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is... A in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. So these first two commandments are about idolatry, prohibiting idolatry. Perhaps, well why? 
Does it start that way? Well, perhaps because idolatry is really the root of all sins. And this is what Paul goes on to say. He lists all sorts of different sinful behavior. And it really started with exchanging or trading the worship of God for the worship of other things. It's been said that the human heart is an idol factory. The human heart is constantly producing idols, false gods. Uh, the Apostle John, in his first letter, first epistle, chapter 5, verse 21, says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, he was writing to Christians. Christians living either in or near the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was well known for its worship of Artemis, famous for the temple of Artemis. You can read of that in Acts chapter 19. That's pagan idolatry. That's the kind of idolatry we're most familiar with. People uh, worshiping a god, making an image of that god, making a temple for that god, and so on. Pagan idolatry. But there's also a different kind of idolatry. We could call it the idolatry of the heart. Uh, for example, in Ezekiel 14, verse 3, God says to Ezekiel, these men have taken their idols into their heart. Taken their idols into their heart. The problem is with the heart. In that same city of Ephesus, there was this other kind of idolatry. Uh, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, says that a covetous person is an idolater. That's one kind. Covetousness is one kind of idolatry. Coveting things. We might call it materialism. That's one form of this idolatry of the heart. John Calvin writes that idolatry is to worship the gifts in place of the giver himself. So they traded the worship of God for the worship of other things. And that's a foolish trade. Imagine me uh, giving up my wife, Marcia, for one of her creations. She's into knitting a lot these days. So what if I just wanted her scarves and hats and slippers and, and didn't uh, care about her, just traded her for all of that knitted stuff or uh, her meals? Uh, I enjoy her meals. Uh, what if I just took her meals and didn't take her? That would be a foolish trait. And so that's sort of how it is with God. We've taken his gifts, we've devoted ourselves to the gifts, but not to God, the giver himself. Uh, Tim Keller defines idolatry as the making of good things into ultimate things. And really, behind this pagan idolatry, we see this, because all of the gods were, were devoted to some sort of thing that uh, is important to us. Good things, uh, there's the god of you know, agriculture, uh, fertility, uh, God of the Son, all of these good things, the gifts from God. The people focused on just the gifts and made false gods, idols, and forget about God himself. Though he revealed himself in nature, they did not pursue God, they did not seek after him, but instead were devoted to his gifts. Uh, in his book, Counterfeit Gods, Keller writes that an idol is Anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. So we get to this kind of idolatry that would be the kind of idolatry that is in the North American culture. It's not that we're bowing down and, and worshiping these things, but these things are what are central in our hearts, turning good things into ultimate things, taking the gifts that God has given to us and making those more important than God himself. Uh, you can see this whenever there's, for example, a, 
a financial crisis. Uh, there are some people who give up on life. They lose millions and millions of dollars and uh, commit suicide. To them, if they don't have their money, if they've lost their money, then life is not worth living. Money really is their God. That's what is most important in their hearts. And so idolatry is turning a good thing like money. It's a good thing that we can earn money. But when we turn it to, into an ultimate thing, then it becomes our God. It becomes an idol. And so this is a way of thinking of idolatry that perhaps we don't normally think of. So again, Paul says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. A foolish trade. When we trade God for an idol, you know, we could list all of the kinds of things that people value in our culture today. Again, there's money, there's jobs, uh, there's our homes, you know, renovating the home, buying a new car, the cottage, the boat. Uh, there's our appearance, physical fitness, uh, beauty, uh, there's pleasure, there's sex, there's all of these different things that uh, our culture values so much. And these are gifts from God and, to, and can be enjoyed, of course, but we must be devoted to God, the giver, and not the gifts. Because when we devote ourselves, our lives, to an idol, we're settling for something less, much less. I want to share with you two ways in which we settle for less when we trade God for an idol. First, these are very basic points. When we trade God for an idol, we become less. We become less. I think Paul was thinking of Psalm 106 when he wrote verse 23. Verse 23 says, well, it's the verse about uh, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things that exchange. And in Psalm 106 verses 19 and 20, the psalmist writes, uh, they have made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a metal image, they exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. So the psalmist is, is referring back to the golden calf incident. Uh, in the book of Exodus, after God had delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, they made a golden calf. They worshipped it. And tragically, this all took place while Moses was up on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments, which began with, do not uh, put any God before me. and Don't uh, make an image. Breaking that very commandment. So after the Israelites made and worshipped the golden calf, it's interesting how God describes them. He describes them as a stiff-necked people. Stiff-necked people. Uh, the golden calf would have been a bull, perhaps an ox. That's what Psalm 106 says. That's a stiff-necked animal. To be stiff-necked is to be stubborn. It's hard to move an ox if it doesn't want to move. I don't have any experience doing that, but I assume that's the case. I have some... Uh, experience with some cows and that sort of thing, but uh, I'm sure an ox is a little more stubborn than that. And we see that in the book of Exodus, how, how stubborn the people were. When it came to them going into the promised land, what did they do? They refused to go. They wouldn't go. They were stiff-necked, like a stubborn ox. And Psalm 115 verse 8 says, those who make idols become like them so do all who trust in them. So those people became like that golden calf that they worshipped, a stiff-necked people, not willing to trust God, refusing to go into the promised land. Now we know that humans were made, we were made to resemble God. Genesis 1.26 says that God made us in His image. 
after his likeness. We were made to, to be like God. Now, not in every way, of course, but we were to reflect his image, sort of like a mirror reflects an image. We were to be like God in how we love or to, or to love one another, uh, show mercy, compassion, uh, search or seek for justice. All of these things, attributes of God that we are to have as his people. We were made in his image. Uh, in his book, We Become What We Worship, uh, G.K. Beale writes, What people revere, they resemble either for ruin or restoration. Now, he writes a whole book on this, but what I would say, just to make it very simple, is that when we devote ourselves to, whether it be money or jobs, some sort of form of materialism, uh, whatever the case might be, we know our own hearts, then we become less like God. We become less like God less like Christ, who is the image of God. We find this word image twice in the book of Romans. We read one verse already. The verse is uh, verse 23, where they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. But the second time we find that word image, it's actually in uh, chapter 8, verse 29, where it talks of the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. That we were made to be conformed to the image of God's Son. That's what God wants for us. But if we devote our lives to other things, if we put ourselves first, and only seek those things, the gifts from God, and not the actual giver, then we become less like God, less like Christ. Really, if you think about it, what people want in this world is for the human race to be like Christ. We talk about how we want the human race to be uh, full of love and peace and justice, and those are the things that Jesus was all about. This is what God wants of us, we who were made in his image. Not to be devoted to the gifts and make those most important. Because when we do that, the, the motive is self-love. Seeking happiness in other things rather than in God himself. And so the less we become of God and the more his image is distorted in us. It's like that mirror is broken and people see less of God in us. So we become less and secondly we get less. When people are devoted to an idol they're looking elsewhere for happiness, for fulfillment, for satisfaction. Uh, people who are devoted to an idol say, if I could only you know, make a little bit more money, get that promotion, if only I could uh, get a boyfriend, girlfriend, get married, have children, uh, get a new home. Then I'd be happy. Then I'd be satisfied. But of course, uh, idols always end up uh, disappointing us. Uh, we see that in the lives of celebrities. These are the people who have reached the pinnacle of human success. They should be the happiest people on earth. But what happens is that many times... They're some of the least happy people on earth. Many times uh, their lives are cut short, sometimes through suicide, overdosing on drugs. Many of these people are not happy, though the world tells us they should be happy. Augustine prayed, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So, we can get everything in this world, but still end up feeling restless, 
and empty, searching for something else. And what we're really searching for, if we don't realize it, even if we don't realize it, is God himself. To know God, our creator. God declared in Jeremiah 2.13, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, a fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that hold no water. Instead of that fresh, that good water, you know, devoting ourselves to these things, these idols, these things that we think will make us happy, it's like forsaking that water, that good water, that fresh water, for a broken, a broken cistern. Maybe there's a little bit of muddy water on the bottom of that cracked cistern. To the woman at the well, Jesus said in John chapter 4, Everyone who drinks of this water, it's talking about the water in the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. So he was talking about a kind of life that always will satisfy, will give us what we have been searching for. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? Again, a foolish trade. I'm sure we all know this, and, and uh, we know that going down the road of, of being devoted to these other things, uh, as Christians we know this, that those things really won't satisfy. But even though we do know that, so often we do set our hearts on these things. They're good things, but if we live our lives thinking that these are the things that will make me happy, then that will end in disappointment. So even as Christians, uh, we can be sucked into this trap. And I think that's why John wrote in 1 John to Christians about keep yourselves from idols. Everyone is worshiping. Everyone is born worshiping. Not merely that we are born to worship, but we are worshiping. We all have the desire for something more. And we try to satisfy that desire with, with all sorts of things. But I believe that only God can satisfy that desire for something more. We can fill it with all sorts of things. But in the end, only God, eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. That's really the only thing that can bring an end to that search for something more. Uh, Blaise Pascal, the, the great French mathematician, scientist, theologian, he said, he's often misquoted a bit, but here's the actual quote that he says in one of his books. He says, what is it then that this desire and this inability proclaim to us, but that there was once in man a true happiness of which there now remain to him only the mark and empty trace, which he in vain tries to fill from all his surroundings, seeking from things absent the help he does not obtain in things present. But these are all inadequate, because the infinite abyss can only be filled by an infinite and immutable object, that is to say, only by God himself. So that emptiness, he's saying, can only be filled by God himself. Now, I think I'm speaking here mostly to believers, and a lot of this is applicable to non-believers. But again, we can be, as I said, sucked into that trap of being devoted, in a sense, worshiping these false gods and getting our eyes off of the Lord and going down that road of, of self-love instead of love for God and love for others and um, not having that image of Christ that we 
are made to bear. To trade God for something else is to settle for so much less. A foolish trade. I was reading, I've shared this before, we actually used a prayer from this book last Sunday, but I was reading this on Friday and I thought this prayer would really be a great way to end this message. And so this prayer is how I'll do that. Lord of all being, there is one thing that deserves my greatest care that calls forth my ardent desires. That is, that I may answer the great end for which I am made, to glorify thee who has given me being, and to do all the good I can for my fellow men. Verily, life is not worth having if it be not improved for this noble purpose. Yet, Lord, how little is this the thought of mankind. Most men seek to live for themselves without much or any regard for thy glory or for the good of others. They earnestly desire and eagerly pursue the riches, honors, pleasures of this life, as if the, they supposed that wealth, greatness, merriment could make their immortal souls happy. But alas, what false delusive dreams are these, and how miserable ere long will those be that sleep in them. For all our happiness consists in loving thee, and being holy as thou art holy. O oh, may I never fall into the temp tempers and vanities, the sensuality and folly of the present world. It is a place of inexpressible sorrow, a vast, empty nothingness. Time is a moment of vapor, and all its enjoyments are empty bubbles, fleeting blasts of wind, from which nothing satisfactory can be derived. Give me grace always, to keep in covenant with thee, and to reject as delusion a great name here or hereafter, together with all sinful pleasures or profits. Help me to know continually that there can be no true happiness, no fulfilling of thy purpose for me, apart from a life lived in and for the Son of thy love. Amen.